I, I drove down Hollywood Boulevard to the studio, and I mean, I knew I was driving there for something good. Hi there. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 444. Today, my guest is Mr. Sean Kanan. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and I'm involved from sunup to sundown in things related to the traditional martial arts, whether it be this show or our store at whistlekick.com. And you can use the code podcast15 to get 15% off maybe a new shirt or uniform, all kinds of good stuff over there. We've also got a lot on Amazon, so check out Amazon too. But we've also got other things that we do. We've got great social media with awesome content that's constantly growing. So check us out. We're at Whistlekick all over the place. You might want to also check out what we're doing on YouTube. We've got First Cup. We've got Who'd Win. Bunch of stuff. So check that out. Let's talk about today's guest. There are quite a few ways you may know today's guest. He's been in movies that you've probably seen. He's been on television. You may recognize him now. You might have recognized him in the past. But at his core, he's a martial artist. And that's why we had him on the show. Because martial arts can lead us in so many different directions. And that's why we bring such varied guests on. It's a powerful and dynamic episode. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Mr. Kanan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, it's great to have you here. I've been looking forward to this one, and I, I know I know we're going to get to some good stuff. We, you know, just I, I can I can sense it. I get a sense when I start talking. You know, <laughs> what the listeners don't know, they don't know that you know. There's, I mean, they they I'm sure they suspect that you and I chat for at least a minute before we kind of hit that that go button, but they don't know what we say. They don't know why I get these feelings, but you know, once in a while I'll get these feelings, and so I got I got a feeling today. <laughs> And so we're going to, we're going to start, we're going to start in a, a really rudimentary way, but okay. I feel like we can really start any other way. And that's, it's a martial arts show. So how did you start with martial arts? I grew up in Western Pennsylvania in a town called Newcastle, Pennsylvania, about 30 minutes from Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, I, I think it was probably, the Rocky came out in 1976. And uh, I think that's about the time that every kid my age decided that they wanted to be uh, a boxer. And so I found a gym in really not a great area in Youngstown, Ohio, and I started doing some boxing there. And my parents realized very quickly that the, the guys that were boxing there were you know, very serious, doing it as a way of you know, getting out of an economic situation, et cetera. And so they said, look, you know, we found a karate dojo in town. It's obviously much closer. Maybe we think you ought to, you ought to do that. I was like, I don't want to say karate. I want to box. And uh, they, they got me to go, and I, I, was, I was just really smitten with it from, from the get-go. Uh, I loved it. Um, uh, so I started when I was about 13. Uh, we started with Shotokan, and then my teacher, the late uh, Bill Stoner, uh, joined Sensei Fumio Dumura's uh, organization, the Japan Karate Federation. And, uh, and then really a, a very curious and interesting series of events took place, um, not the least of which was, you know, Sente Demera was Pat Morita's stunt double in all the Karate Kid films. And as time went on, as I got older, uh, and I was later going to school at Boston University and very much wanting to start my acting career, and, and uh, you know, I decided to go to, from Boston to UCLA. Um, I spoke with Sensei Demera and he said, look, they're going to do this uh, open call for Karate Kid 3 for the new bad guy. I think you ought to go. And uh, so I went and there were about 2,000 guys wrapped around the outside of the, uh, of the studio. And there was John Abelson, uh, diminutive guy, you know, not, not real tall, uh, walking this long line of hopefuls with a, a camera crew and intermittently stopping and asking people to do a quick improv with them. Then I knew I had to get his attention. I have probably about two seconds to do it. So he stopped when he saw me and he said, do a quick improv with me. And he's like, I buy it. And he sent me inside 
And once I got inside the studio, it was like a three ring circus. Entertainment Tonight was there, all sorts of media outlets. They had set up, um, they had set up a, a set, and there was Ralph Macchio, and that was just so surreal. You know, uh, I had been a paying customer for the first two episodes of uh, the first two uh, uh, installments, The Karate Kid, and then the, the first sequel. And now here I am auditioning for the third one. And they asked me to do uh, a scene with Ralph. They asked me to kind of intimidate him, back him into a corner, and I, I did that. And, uh, you know, I went through a couple more little uh, hoops, and I, I felt really good about it. I felt I had a good chance of getting the role, and I found out within a couple of days that I didn't get it, and it was really crushing. And uh, a couple of days later, I got a phone call, and it turns out they fired the guy that they had initially hired and they called me back and I, I drove down Hollywood Boulevard to the studio. And I mean, I knew I was driving there for something good. You know, they don't call you back to tell you again, that you didn't do a good job. And, you know, I always like to tell a little story about, you know, as I was driving down, when you look to the, the Hollywood sign, depending on where you are in your career and what your relationship is to the sign, at any given time seems to change. Sometimes it, it winks at you and sometimes it smirks. And it was, it was definitely winking that day. And uh, I showed up at the studio and there was Robert Mark Kamen who had written The Karate Kid sequel, you know, late, later went on to write Taken. I mean, he's written so many big movies, blockbusters. John Abelson, and they spoke with me for a few minutes, put me through a couple of you know, basic martial arts uh, drills. They left to go Jason's uh, office, came back after a few minutes, and they sent me to wardrobe, and my life changed. It's a pretty powerful story. Yeah. What was that feeling like? What was it in that moment? I mean, obviously, you're, as you said, you're driving down Hollywood Boulevard. You know something good is yeah. coming, but I think we can all relate. We've all had experiences where this is going to be something great, and, and it wasn't. It didn't live up to it. You know, so here you are, you get there, you get to the studio, the set, you walk in, you have that conversation with whomever it is. And how did that conversation go? I mean, you know, when I was driving down Hollywood Boulevard, it, it was electric for me. I mean, it, it was, I, I felt an energy that something was about to change my life. And, you know, you spend so much time as, your, as an actor hearing no. Uh, getting rejected, uh, you know, and, and when you feel like you've suddenly entered into the bullseye zone of, of getting a role, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to wrangle your thoughts because they, they start to run away from you. You start to extrapolate and project what this could be. And, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting and it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of an intoxicating mental exercise. Um, I have learned to get much better with that as I've gotten older, um, you know, sort of to stay the middle path with things. But back then when I wasn't so adept at doing it, in retrospect, it really was, uh, you know, it was intoxicating. It was, it was a, a crazy feeling to think, oh my God, this, this may just work out. Was that your first real role in a film? It was my first real role in film. I had done a really crappy horror film before that, but I had done, I think I had done one or two, I had done one or two television shows as guest stars. Um, and uh, what's, what's kind of interesting, ironic, I don't know. I was doing a show called Werewolf and John J. York was the star of it. John J. York uh, played Max Scorpio in General Hospital. We would later go on to work together for years. And that's kind of ironic. But the funnier thing was that the co-star on the show was a guy named Mark Sussman, and Mark Sussman's best friend at the time happened to be Billy Zabka. And so Billy came to the set, and we got to know each other. And I mean, I was just like so jazzed to meet Billy. I mean, I have Johnny Lawrence, the whole thing. And, you know, in a very short amount of time, uh, I sort of then was admitted to the, 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 the Cobra Kai fraternity. Uh, so just interesting how, how life can work out sometimes. What was that like? Because you talked about seeing. Karate Kid and Karate Kid 2 in the theaters. Yeah. And if I'm, if I'm connecting these dots right, you're pretty much the target demographic. I mean, 
an interest in martial arts and in and those films i mean if you went back for the second one they must the first one must have resonated for you in some way yeah and then here fairly quickly after you know it flips into now you're on the other side of the camera right did you feel any pressure being that you enjoyed the franchise and now we're part of making it enjoyable for others yeah i mean there was a lot of pressure on a multitude of, of levels the first was that i had really just begun my acting career i had not studied a lot uh i was very green um, i think the reason i was hired was i had a specific look that worked i had the martial arts ability and i had just a uh, an arrogant brashness that comes from not knowing what you don't know and and that worked um but you know once we got on the set and i saw you know and i started to internalize what's expected of me you know it was challenging i mean i i made i made a lot of mistakes and there's things i would do very differently now as a you know as, a, as an older seasoned actor but i also i guess obviously did what was needed of me because they were you know, they, they were ultimately very happy with what I did. And, you know, I, I think the fans, fans enjoyed, you know, my, my uh, interpretation of, of Mike Barnes. Now, you've already brought up that you've acted in, in other things. And anyone who checks out your IMDb profile will see you've, you've been in quite a few things. How did that role in Karate Kid 3 lead to all this other stuff? You know, the thing with Karate Kid 3 is that because they're... Uh, the Rosaris, uh, there was already the first two films. There was a worldwide audience. So, I mean, I was stepping into a machine that had a built-in fan base, and and you know, almost overnight when it when it began screening, you know, people knew who I was. I mean, it opened up avenues for me to get you know some big auditions. Um, one of which was a show called The Outsiders, based on S. E. Hinton's. You know, seminal book. I grew up reading the books of S.C. Hinton. Um, you know, that was then. This is now. Rumblefish, um, The Outsiders, and I, I, Francis Ford Coppola was producing the show, uh, and I, uh, uh, I got the part, and it was a big deal. Um, you know, from there I went to go to a, a small part in a film with Oliver Stone. Um, so you know, it opened up some really nice doors for me. Uh, and then much in the way that eventually getting on, um, you know, much in the way that getting on uh, a soap opera did the same thing because they, the, you know, these soap operas have, you know, decade, multi-decade long fan bases so that when you, you become a character on them, um, you, you know, it's an incredible amount of exposure. And in the case of The Bold and the Beautiful, which I did, it's in the Guinness World Book of Records as the most syndicated show in television history, more than Baywatch. So I was suddenly being shown in 110 countries. Now, through all this, as you're building your acting resume and and building your acting skills, what's going on with your martial arts? You know, martial arts is something that I've always come back to. Um, You know, I I have not been in class for years and years and years nonstop. But, uh, you know, off and on, I've studied with different people. uh, I studied uh, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu for uh, for a while. Uh, studied Krav Maga for a while. Um, I studied uh, American kickboxing. So it's always been something that I've come back to from time to time. Uh, you know, and and the other thing is that it's it's you know it's helped me tremendously uh, in. Uh, you know, different, different acting jobs that I've had. You know, I, I worked with Chuck Norris on uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. I got to do a fight scene with Chuck Norris, which was just, you know, I, I, remember, awesome. I remember when I was a kid, my dad had met Chuck Norris somewhere and brought me a signed picture from Chuck Norris that said, Sean, keep on kicking. And I mean, that was my life. I was like, are you kidding me? Chuck Norris. And then to, to you know, grow up and wind up working with Chuck uh, years later was, you know, a dream come true. One of the things that we've heard from past guests who have spent time acting is it, it seems like the majority of people who do martial arts on film are martial artists who learn how to act. 
And then you've got this other crop of people who are actors who also know martial arts. Which one are you? Uh, you know, I definitely wouldn't consider myself. Uh, I mean, I've studied martial arts extensively, but there's a big difference between me and, you know, say somebody like Jean Claude Van Damme or I don't know, you know, you pick, pick a name of a guy that's a world class martial artist. Um, you know, I had a, a really good, strong foundation in martial arts. Um, you know, there were certain things I was able to execute do very well, and there were certain things that were beyond my purview. Um, but I mean, I came to LA to study acting. I mean, I was not like a guy that was, you know, a martial artist and, like you said, got stuck in film and then had to learn to act. I mean, I was out here studying with Roy London, who was one of was one of the finest acting teachers of all time. And I mean, I was working, you know, assiduously to to you know. Uh, build myself as uh you know as as a respected actor i don't know if that answered your question well, have, but it's a bit of, it's a it, bit of both it, I guess. it does it, it does and and that's i mean we 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 talked about tangents and and that sometimes the questions don't always lead to a concrete answer actually we didn't talk about that but i i i'm always prepared for that and and listeners know that you know I'll throw a question out. It doesn't mean that there's a easy way to wrap it up. Right. Right. And, and how you present, you know, your vision of yourself. I mean, that's what matters the most here. You know, this is your story of your, your time through the martial arts. One of my favorite sayings uh, is that martial arts is always there for you when you're ready to go back to it. And you, you, you kind of talked about that. When else, or have you had opportunities to use your martial arts in roles beyond Karate Kid? Yeah, like I said, the, the, the you know the role that I did was Chuck Norris. Uh, in, oh right. Yeah, um, I did a film called uh, The Chaos Factor uh, mm -hmm. with, with Fred Ward, where I did uh, uh, I had a great fight scene in that. That was a lot of fun. I think more than the physical aspect of martial arts, you know, there's there's certain mental aspects of martial arts that I'm able to call upon when I'm when I'm acting. I think there's you know, there's there's some discipline and some some sort of some sort of mind game stuff that I'm able to tap into. Uh, I'm, you know, it, it helps me with my acting. Tell us a story from from your time, whether it's you know in a dojo or traveling or on set or something. Tell tell us a story that you know the listeners might appreciate hearing. I'll often ask this as your favorite martial arts story, but I think I got to use slightly different words as I ask it for you. Well, I mean, I, I, it's probably not the answer you want, but I mean, is there a better martial arts story than getting the lead, you know, getting the role as the, the new lead villain in the Cobra Kai from an open call? I mean, that's, I, I don't think I can top that. That's a pretty great story. I just don't think I can top well, that. Then, well, then give us, give us something from in that time, you know, maybe something working with Ralph Macchio or, or working with, with Pat Morita. You know, give give us well, I mean, give us something that we might not know from watching the film. Okay, well, I just I don't know how interesting this is going to be, but I won't censor it. Um, um, you know, I I was a huge Pat Morita fan before the whole Karate Kid movie uh, franchise because I grew up on Happy Days, and uh, he was uh, uh, you know he was uh, he was Arnold who ran Arnold. And so for me, you know, when I got on the set and met Pat Morita, I mean, I really felt like I knew this guy. Uh, it was just an amazing uh, feeling to, you know, be sharing the stage with, uh, with this guy that I had just, you know, I would race home from school uh, during lunchtime when I was in elementary school to go watch, uh, you know, to go watch Happy Days. Um, years later, I got to present an award uh, to Henry Winkler, and uh, actually, over the years, met many of the people uh, who, starting Happy Days, uh, actually about four weeks ago, uh, I just presented an award to uh, Marion Ross, who played Mrs. C. So it's just funny. It's it's just interesting who you get to meet as your career goes on. You, you never know who you're going to come into contact with. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's that's that story 
Yeah, no, good question. Uh, absolutely. It does. It does. When you think about who you are as a martial artist today, you know, take all the different instructors and different pieces, the things that you've learned at various locations. If you had to pick one person out for having the most influence on who you consider yourself to be as a martial artist, who might that person be? I mean, it would have to be a toss up between my, my teacher, William Stoner and Sensei Demura. Uh, you know, Sensei Demura, uh, I was I was recently inducted into the Masters Hall of Fame a couple, about a month and a half ago, and uh, it was an incredible honor. And um, you know, Sensei Demura was there. And have you ever met him? Have you ever? Met I have him? not, but I was lucky enough that he he was he's on the show a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, he you know they they made a movie about him, The Real Miyagi, and he to me really. He really uh, encapsulates the very best qualities of being a martial artist. You know, uh, he is, you know, one of the finest people I know. And I, I think that he's always served as, uh, you know, as a, as a mentor, as a, uh, someone who has inspired me, uh, probably on some levels at certain uh, times in my life, he's watched over me when I didn't know he was. Um, so I would say the two of them. Well, I I don't know the former, but if you're going to put him on par with Sensei Demura, that says a tremendous amount about him. Right. So you you uh, sounds like you're pretty fortunate. I am very 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 fortunate. Yes. And now we ask kind of the opposite of that question: If you could train with someone, if you could add someone to that mix. Anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, who would you want to train with? I guess it would be a couple of people that come to mind. I mean, obviously, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say Bruce Lee, Masoyama, uh, Heidi Ochai, probably Boyce Gracie. Let's talk about Bruce Lee for a moment because we pretty much can't get through an episode without talking about Bruce Lee uh, because he's the quintessential martial artist. I mean, 40 years gone and, and, He's still the one that has the most name recognition and, and visual recognition. As so a martial artist and an actor, I mean, he kind of paved the way for that genre of film in the U.S. What would you hope to gain from training with him? Bruce was a, uh, an amazing philosopher, uh, martial artist aside. Uh, he wrote a book called Striking Thoughts, which... Uh, I think is a brilliant, brilliant insight into life. Uh, and so I think it would be uh, incredible to, to have a relationship with him, to learn from him. Uh, you know, somebody came there from a completely different part of the world and culture. Um, I think, I think that, that would be, that would be one of the most interesting parts of being with him. I, I honestly feel that, the physical aspect of martial arts would be a second to that. A very different type of answer than we've had before. Why? What kind of answers? Did you, you grow up reading his books? Yeah. Uh, people are usually talk about, you know, it, it is the physical. It's, and when we've had folks on who respected him as an actor as well, maybe they, you know, did some acting. They, you know, they wanted to talk to him about early on scene stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Well, but, Everyone's got their reasons. Oh, totally, totally. Did you grow up reading his books? Yeah, as, as I said, one of the one of the books that really had a, a profound uh, uh, effect on me was Striking Thoughts. What's your favorite Bruce Lee movie? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, probably Enter the Dragon, but I like Game of Death a lot too. Absolute classics. I have this theory that. The first Bruce Lee movie that you see is your favorite. Uh, that's, that's, that's probably a really good theory. It's, it's held up pretty well across the show. Uh, most people see Enter the Dragon first, but for the people that don't say Enter the Dragon, it's usually because they didn't see Enter the Dragon first. Right. Their favorite. So Let's switch gears a little bit here. So sure. we all go through rough stuff. And I feel that martial artists have a little bit more in their toolbox to address difficult times in life. Tell us about a time in life when 
things weren't going so well and how you were able to reflect or use your martial arts in some way to get through it? Off the top of my head, um, you know, as I said before, acting is a very, very difficult profession. Uh, the, the business of acting is very difficult. Uh, acting is, is a whole different set of challenges, but the business of acting is emotionally very difficult. It can be financially very difficult um, and psychologically battering. Um, and I, I remember also when I began studying karate, there were just moments I had of just abject frustration just thinking I wasn't going to be able to do something. I was never going to be able to be good at this. I, I was, you know, I, I would start that, that negative tape. And I think that in times when I've experienced difficulty in my acting career, um, I have sort of harkened back to times that I maybe was having difficulty, uh, you know, as a martial artist and, uh, and, and realize that with diligence and practice and tenacity, uh, achievement comes. Not always, but usually. And I think it's kind of helped me stay in the game. Uh, you know, there's, there's no truer statement for most actors than acting as a marathon, not a 50-yard dash. There's a lot of people that out of the box, they hit it and just ascend in a in an upper trajectory like a burning star but you know for most of us it's fits and starts and you know it's 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 kind of the long haul and over the course of that long haul there are certainly uh you know moments of frustration and you know all of those sort of feelings that, that you know i've had to do my best to contend with in a way so that it doesn't become debilitating uh, and I, I think martial arts has helped me with that quite a bit. What would your life have looked like without martial arts? Would you have still become an actor, you think? Ooh, well, I, I definitely don't think I would have gotten the part in Karate Kid 3. And if I, if I hadn't gotten that part, I still would have been an actor. I like to think I still would have been a successful actor, but it gave me such a turbo shot of adrenaline in the beginning of my career. I, I just, uh, it's difficult to imagine. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I can't overestimate the advantage that that gave me very early on. One of the more polarizing questions that we ask, not, not in any kind of dramatic fashion, but just we get one way or the other is about martial arts movies. So here you are, you're kind of, uniquely qualified to to look at them and i wonder if if because of your experience on camera you look at martial arts films a little bit differently you know do you enjoy them or avoid them oh no i enjoy them i mean i you know i think traditionally you know martial arts films fall in a couple different categories i mean there's certainly the exploitation films where yes, there's there's great martial arts, but the acting is so bad that it becomes difficult to watch, you know. And and over time, and and I, but actually, you know, with Bruce Lee, who I, I thought happened to be quite a good actor, um, you know, you have martial arts films where there's fantastic martial arts, but there's acting to support the story, which makes it more compelling. But you know, sometimes I I, I love just zoning out sometimes and watching like crazy martial arts. But like one of my favorite martial arts movies is. The Five Deadly Venoms. Um, do you know that one? I do. I do. Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it in a while. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just, sometimes I love what, you know, I, I love watching that sort of kung fu theater stuff. And then other times, um, you know, I, I, it's one of the reasons I really love the Karate Kid. I mean, you know, the, the, the karate in the Karate Kid up until the final fight scene was basic. Um, you know, then you get into the stuff that, you know, Master Daryl Vidal did uh, at the end. And, and even to a certain extent, the stuff that uh, Zabka did, um, it was much more sophisticated. But it's not, you know, uh, in the hierarchy of complexity of martial arts films, it doesn't rank very high. But the message is so compelling that it has a visceral, a 
effect on the viewer, much in the same way as Rocky does. And, you know, the combination of the music and watching this young kid overcome these obstacles every single time to this day when I see it, you know, and then when he's at that final fight, I, I get that, you know, that feeling in my stomach. Uh, so I guess, I guess there's different martial arts films I like for different reasons. If you could construct your own film and, and the one, uh, the one criteria I'll, I'll stipulate is that it has to involve martial arts in some way. But if you had, let's say a crazy budget and unlimited access, <laughs> who would be in your perfect movie? Um, oh boy, that's a tough one. I mean, without even knowing what the script is or anything like that, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I mean, I can tell you some actors I really love. Uh, sure. uh, Robert Downey is one of my favorite actors and he's, he's quite an accomplished martial artist himself. Um, I love Nicolas Cage. He's <laughs> just crazy and bombastic and sporadically good to sporadically gnawing on the scenery, but I love him. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's 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 a tough one. I'd have to think about that one. I don't. I don't. I don't really know. I, I, I don't think I have a great answer for that one. What's coming down the road? What's in the future for you? If you so, look out five years, ten years, well, what are you the, looking for? Well, in the in, in the in the immediate future, uh, I just finished a film called Colonials, which is a a sci-fi film, and I actually got to do martial arts in that, uh, albeit not a lot, but uh, I had a, a fight scene in that. Uh, and then I have a film coming out with Steven Seagal and uh, CMX called Beyond the Law uh, that gets released on December 6th. And uh, uh, beyond that, you know, I've, I've published two books. I'm working on my third. Uh, my third book is a autobiographical, inspirational, motivational, philosophical book, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm very impassioned by. Um, I'm doing a lot of motivational speaking now. Um, I really, for me, inspiring other people is really one of my profound passions. Uh, whether I'm having the opportunity to talk to a bunch of kids about bullying uh, in high school or just sitting down one-to-one -one with somebody and, and trying to help, help them work through some stuff. Uh, so I hope that I can continue to be someone that is uh, always seeking my highest self and I'm, believe me I'm human I stumble frequently uh, trying to inspire other people continuing to grow as an actor you know continuing to be a good husband and good father yeah. being exciting parts of the world and, and having new adventures where, where does that passion for inspiring others come from? There's, there's a feeling I get when I see certain things that, that impassions me and inspires me. Uh, you know, it might sound corny, but you know, when I meet military people and I see their commitment, I just got back from Washington, DC and, and, you know, there's so much divisiveness going on in our government, but I had the opportunity to go up and lobby on Capitol Hill. And I saw congressional staff from both sides of the aisle. And, you know, just the thought that, you know, as Americans, we still have the ability to enter into a congressional office and and sort of say our piece, that that really inspired me. It really inspired me to believe in our, you know, our governmental system with all of its flaws and all of its shortcomings and and you know aspects of it that are indeed broken. It still inspires me. You know, as, as cinema inspires me. There's so many moments, like I said, you know, Rocky and Karate Kid. And the, that still sort of inspire me. And the feeling that I get when I feel like that, uh, I, I, I've learned that, you know, and I, I'm, I'm able to transmute that to other people through my experience and some of what I've learned and the mistakes I've made and the, 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 the path I've, I've walked. And, and uh, I, I guess on some level, it's selfish because it makes me feel good. Um, you know, it really is true that giving is better than getting. And uh, I, I enjoy, I enjoy giving to others. I can relate to that. Absolutely. Cool. Now, if people want to find you online, if they want to see what you've got going on, where where would they go? 
best way to keep up with me. Um, I hope everyone would follow me on Twitter at, uh, at Sean Cannon or on Instagram at Sean Cannon. Keeping it straightforward. <laughs> cool. Well, we ask everybody to send us out in kind of the same way, but of course, everyone chooses a different path. What parting words, what wisdom would you offer up to the people listening today? I would say that we all have an inner masterpiece which is meant to be shared with the world. And that inner masterpiece is our authentic selves, our best self. And by continuing to strive to lead your best life and to help other people, it allows that masterpiece to be revealed. And in revealing that masterpiece, uh, it, it helps the whole world, it helps others. I think that's kind of my message. I love speaking with martial arts actors, whether they be actors who learn martial arts or martial artists who start acting. It's that toolkit that we have, those resources we have available to us as martial artists. And hearing how they're able to take that side of themselves and use it to become other people temporarily in a way that brings us joy. And I just find that so compelling. Mr. Kanan, I really appreciate your time today, your stories, your openness. Thank you, and I hope we talk again soon. If you want to see everything from this episode, from photos to links and more, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 444. You can see everything that we talked about. You can check out other episodes while you're there. Sign up for the newsletter. You might also follow us on social media, at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. My email address, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. The best way to support us, head to whistlekick.com, make a purchase in the store. Podcast 15 gets you 15% off. If you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love hearing from everyone. That's all I've got for you. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Great day.